if I told you that you are heirs to the universe, but you are completely unaware of it, would you believe it? Well, that is what scripture teaches. That we are heirs to the universe, but we do not know it. That's why we are here. So Paul tells us in his letter to the Galatians that the heir, as long as he is a child, is no better than a slave. <clears throat> Where he owns the entire estate. He is under guardian and trustees until the time set by the Father. So with us. When we were children, we were slaves to the el elementary spirit of the universe. What does he mean by it? Well, he tells us quite clearly, if you read his letters in a serious vein, anyone who believes in anything outside of himself is enslaved by these elemental spirits. He calls it believing in what Christianity would tell us. As he said, I'm afraid I have labored over you in vain. For I notice as I pass by that you observe days and weeks and months and seasons and years. I'm afraid I have labored over you in vain. So any outside ritual, whether it be a mass the observation of a day, a month, a holy this, holy that, all this to him is simply be a slave of the elemental spirit. This story is told us in the parable of the prodigal son. When the second one returned, having spent all, the first son complained that I have been with you always and you never gave me a kid. And he said, son, you are with me always and all that is mine is yours. Then he tells him that it's right that we should make merry and rejoice and be glad because this your brother was dead and he is alive. He was lost and he is found. Do you know that story is our story? We were heirs to the whole vast universe, but like the first son, we were unaware of it. The first son never left his father's home. You and I were chosen in the beginning to leave, to become aware of our possession and we go through hell to become aware of it. So you and I go through all the horrors of the world to awaken us to who we really are. And when we awaken, we are the Father. It's the Father's purpose to give himself to us. And while we were with the Father, we did not know his purpose. We did not know our possession. So he could selected us. He said, I chose them in me before the foundation of the world. And then we came down into this world and took upon ourselves these garments of flesh. The one who took it is the Son of God. He is crucified on these garments. 
And when he passes through the furnaces of affliction, he will awaken and know himself to be the Father. For it's the Father's purpose to give himself to his Son. And you and I are the sons of God. All of us, regardless of your sex, we are the sons. So when we pass through the furnaces, then, in the fullness of time, he sends the spirit of his son into our heart, crying, Father. Now who is this son that he sends into our heart, crying, Father? Let me take you now into scripture with me. For the purpose here, for all of us, is simply to fulfill his word, which is scripture. That's the only purpose I've come to fulfill scripture. When he awakes within us, then he understands the scripture, the word. Now listen to this carefully. Go to my servant, David. And say to David that when your days are fulfilled and you lay down with your fathers, I will raise up your son after you who will come forth from your body. I will be his father and he shall be my son. David is a symbol of humanity. The whole vast world of man. That's David. So say to humanity, I will raise up from your body a son that will come forth from your body. If he comes forth from the body of man, then he must be the son of man. So Christ calls himself the son of man. Yet he is the Son of God. For the prophecy is, I will raise up your Son who shall come forth from your body. I, the Lord, will be his Father, and he shall be my Son. The dreamer in you, and by that dreamer in you I mean your own wonderful human imagination. That is the Son of God. That is the Son of Man. One day he will awaken in you. And he will rise in you. And he will come forth from that body that is dead. We think it's alive. I will tell you when it happens to you and you see that other which you come. You look at it and to you it is dead. You are buried in it, and you are dreaming and animating this world through your dreams, and dreaming this whole vast world in which you now live. And the day will come you will awaken within, and that will come out. If it comes out of man, then it's the son of man. Yet the Lord said, I will be his father, and he shall be my son. This one that comes up is one with the Father. And he makes, he makes the statement, I and my Father are one. In the end, go and say, I am the root and the offspring of David. David is humanity. That I am the root, the Father of humanity. And I am also that which comes out of humanity. I will raise it myself out of humanity because the sons that came down form God. The word God is a plural word, Elohim, made up of his sons. We are all the sons. But we were not aware of who we are and what we possess. So we came down a certain number, just a certain number, not an indefinite number, may I tell you, just a certain number. Every child born of woman is a son of God. 
the Son came down into the world, and he set a limit to the number, as we are told in the 32nd chapter of the book of Deuteronomy. And he is put down to the people according to the number of the sons of God. So in spite of all that we seem to do today, to limit the offspring of the world is all a play. It's all done. Not one child could breathe, but what? That breath is but the Son of God. Everyone in the world is the Son of God. But he doesn't know it. And he goes through all the fires of this world to awaken to the knowledge of who he really is. He is God. He didn't know it, so he comes down into the world. And he goes through all these horrible things in the world and plays his part. But in the fullness of time, and God sends forth the Spirit of his Son into our hearts, crying, Father. He calls the Father. Well, who is it? It is the sum total of humanity who is calling us Father. For we are the Father of David, and yet we are the offspring. For we buried ourselves in humanity. We came out of humanity. Therefore, the Son of Man. And yet we are the father of humanity. And humanity being symbolized by David, David stands before us and calls us father. So here when one complains, as the first one complains, he said, son, you are with me always. And all that is mine is yours. But he doesn't know it. You own the universe, and if you don't know it, you could die of starvation. For the want of one dollar. Because you can't appropriate anything. Because you think it isn't yours. You think only what your senses dictate belongs to you. You think that only what reason allows you could claim. You can't for one moment bring yourself to believe that the whole thing is yours, and all you have to do is to appropriate it. It is yours. Now you're told in scripture, whatever you believe, if you really persuade yourself of the reality of what you are believing, you shall have it. When you pray, believe that you have received, and you will. All things are possible to God. Well, the average person was a yes to God, but not to me, because he's not awake. He doesn't know that he is God. And that the word God causes him to see for one moment of the existence of something external to himself, he has a false God. Why? Because God's name forever and forever is I am. When I go to the people of Israel and I say to them, the God of your fathers, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob sent me. And they ask me, what is his name? What? Should I say, say unto them, I am, that is who I am. Say to them, I am, sends me unto you, for this is my name forever, and by this name I shall be known throughout all generations. Well now, if you hear the word God and you don't think of I am, you've got the wrong God. If you hear the word Jehovah, and it doesn't conjure within you the feeling of, well, I'm aware, then you got the wrong God. All things are possible to God, yes, but if you think he's on the outside, you've gone astray. If you know God, and the word God instantly reminds you of who you are, and all things are possible to God, and all things are God, well, then you appropriate it. You simply take it. You don't rob anyone. It's all yours. So you want a better job? You want a better position in this world? A better home? This, that, or the other? You simply assume that you have it. You dare to assume that you are in possession now of what you really want in this world. And if you dare to persist in that assumption, it will harden into fact. This is what scripture teaches. What others teach, 
is a, another matter. But as Paul tells us, when we were children, we were slaves to the elemental spirit. That simply means all external rituals in the world. When I stood in the presence of infinite love, and infinite love embraced me, and then sent me. And as he sent me, the words rang out, down with the blue blood. But I didn't understand what it meant. But I came out with this ringing in my ear, down with the blue blood, to discover years later, it meant church protocol. That's all that it meant. Any external ritual that would enslave me, where I am threatened with a curse if I do not observe days, months, seasons, and years. If I do not observe the mass, if I do not observe all the things on the outside, including circumcision, including anything, if I believe in astrology as something that is actually dictating my life, an influence in my world, then I've got a false God. I must have but one God, only one God, and that one God is my own wonderful human imagination. That's your God, and there is no other God. Now, put it to the test. He said, test me and see. If I will not open the windows of heaven and pour out a blessing so great you have not room on earth to receive it. Test me. Well, how do I test it? Well, what do I want? <clears throat> then I assume that I have it and feel as I would feel if it were true. And then, as I feel it, I live in that feeling, sleep in that feeling, and then I must have it in my world if this thing is true. But that's what I have taught in Scripture. Do you not realize that Jesus Christ is in you? Well, the average person, if you say that to him, he does not realize Jesus Christ is in him. When he says, I am, he does believe for one moment that is Jesus Christ. He thinks, I am a little, little tiny being called this, that, or the other. He doesn't really believe he is the Lord Jesus Christ. And I tell you that your true identity is Jesus Christ. Until you believe it and put it to the test, then you don't really believe it. Walk as though you were the Lord Jesus Christ. And may I tell you, you will act as the Lord Jesus Christ. And you will actually believe for what for well, at any moment, that you are capable of doing anything in this world without raising a finger. You simply assume that things are as they are asked of you. Whatever is asked of you, you assume that it's done. You feel the thrill as though they told you that it's done. And just let it go that way. You'll find all these lovely things unfolding within you. So, if you did not come out, and you did come out, you will be the first son complaining because he now kills the fatted calf and brings the robe and the ring and puts shoes upon your feet because you return from the journey. And he said, it's good that we should rejoice and be merry for this your brother was dead and he's alive. He's alive to who he is. He was lost. Well, now he's found. But the first one never left home. And therefore he has no awareness of his possessions. He doesn't know what he possesses. And if you had the whole vast universe that you did, but you don't know it, well then what good would it be to you? You couldn't appropriate any part of it. Yet you're told in scripture, if I were hungry I wouldn't dare you. For the world is mine, and all that is. The cattle on a thousand hills are mine. I would say a leaf. The man is not aware that the whole thing is his, so he doesn't appropriate anything. He limits himself to what his senses dictate, what reason dictates, and he will not go beyond it. Yet he's invited by scripture to step out <coughs> and test this law. For well, I tell you, you are the sons of God that came down 
into this world to become aware of who you are. You did not know it. In the beginning, you had to come out and become slaves. And Paul calls us slaves. We're all slaves. We are slaves of the elemental spirit. Where I'm a slave when I think I've got to get up in the morning and go to mass. I've got to go to church. <clears throat> I've got to keep certain days of the year holy. I've got to do this, that, and the other. I'm a slave of it. I must say grace before dinner. As I sit down and say grace, it may be a lovely custom, but that can become a habit, and that can be an elemental spirit that actually enslaves you. Anything on the outside, all ritual, and I was told the whole thing rang in my ear, down with the blue blood, all church protocol. Anything that is man-made, done with it, and just simply live the most normal, wonderful life in the world. Now let me bring to your attention tonight a little thought. A friend of mine wrote me, I got the letter, yesterday. He said, this thing has been haunting me for the last two weeks. See, God speaks to man through the medium of dreams. But we are past masters at misinterpreting the dream. And for two weeks I wrestled with myself because this thing is so, to me, on this level, so unlovely. Here in dream, I had an affair with my stepdaughter. Something I couldn't dream of on this level. And she seemed to invite me into this act. I love her dearly as a stepdaughter, but certainly I never entertained that thought on this level, and yet it seemed there right. Now we said, I admire her, I love her dearly, I love her great spiritual qualities, things I would like to have myself. Well, let me I tell him, on these levels, which seems immoral from this level, they are not immoral at all. I ask you to go home and read the sixth chapter of First Corinthians and read these words. He who is joined to a harlot becomes one body with her. As it is written, the two shall become one flesh. Then he goes on the very next verse. He who is united to the Lord becomes one spirit with him. He takes the most graphic picture in the world, which is sex, the beginning of it all, to show you the greatest story ever told. Man who is united to the spirit through the Lord becomes one spirit with him, and he shows you this other story. He is in love with what he represents, what he stands for. He has incurrent eyes. He would love to have these eyes. Love to be able to see into the world of eternity, into the world of thought, and see reality as against what the shadow world shows. And he actually touched her. He actually knew her. And it was completed. For one is actually receiving the gift of that which he believes the other to possess. When God embraced me, he was a father. He was love. He was power. He was wisdom. And as he embraced me, and I fused with him, for well, then he transferred to me all that he is, that was his gift to me. That was his grace upon me. He gave me fatherhood. So in time, his son stood before me and called me father. He being the father of humanity. Humanity being personified as a single being called David. David stands before me and calls me father. He being loved, my whole being transformed itself into that going more and more into that form of love. 
So in his case, he actually was drawn to one he admired for her spiritual qualities. And here, a union took place. So she transferred to him what he sees in her as a spiritual quality. On this level, no, you be completely annoyed with himself, even to entertain the thought. But you see, in the depth of one's soul, there's nothing that is wrong. And all these things unfold within the being. So I can say to him, you're blessed. Blessed because he is one that is blessed. And if he seems to be the one who drew you into the story, and you actually, you said, I actually felt right about it there, yet on reflection, I felt strange about it. But I've got to get it off my chest. I've been resting for the last two weeks. Now, it must come to the surface and get it off in the air. And so, he tells me the story. I tell you that you are blessed. As I am used in my capacity today in the same strange manner, as a man called Neville on this level, I'm totally unaware of these contacts, but in the depths of my soul, I know. On Wednesday morning, I try to show a few of you, about four or five of you, something, and you would not even look. I saw the most glorious sky, the most heavenly blue, and these lovely creeks across the sky, making them a fantastic pattern. And you would not, or you could not look at it. And here I'm trying to show you the garment that I wear. And you saw a book about the size of this little lectern, just about the size of this. You could only see it reflected on the flat surface of a book. And I'm trying to show you the difference between this cubic reality and that flat surface that depicts it. And how different this living cubic reality from that surface that only depicts it, but you would not look up. You either would not or could not look up. And this living, living garment that occupies the entire sky, this heavenly blue, and then against the heavenly blue, streaks of transparent white clouds. But what a pattern. But it was not just a cloud, it was a light live garment, a living garment. And I tried so hard to get you to look, but you would not look. So here, in this state, I tell him that he is blessed. Don't be afraid or be ashamed to tell me any story of that nature, because it doesn't mean what it seems to mean on this level. In the depth of your own being, all these things that seem here to be immoral are not immoral at all. When I embrace the Heavenly Father, or he, rather, he embraced me, that was union. That was baptism by the Holy Spirit. And it was an actual creative act. And then sent into the world to do what I am doing. A little water in your head, that's not baptism, that's only a shadow. That's what you looked when you looked at the little book. To see reflected on a little thing the size of this, what the whole vast sky was doing. How could you do it? So I tell you, you and I came out, came down into this world, and assumed these garments of flesh and blood. These are the crosses that Christ bears. Christ is buried in us, and Christ must rise in us. And the only cross he ever wore is the cross of humanity. And this is his cross. And we are the grave. And he will rise in us. When he rises in us, not as another, he rises in us as ourselves. He actually rises 
as your own wonderful human being. And then you are completely transformed. Now they ask Paul. As Paul said, and some will say to thee, How is the dead raised? And with what God does he come? Paul only answers in this manner. He wears the body that is given to him by God. God gives him a body that he has chosen. But he doesn't define the body and describe the body. May I tell you from my own experience, it's a body of life. It seems a body of fire. Fiery light in air. You don't even touch the ground. But the thing that you really inherit, Paul is talking about, you inherit a body. He said, we are heirs. If I'm an heir, I'm an heir to something. I'm going to inherit something. And he calls it the estate. But the estate is a body. That body in which you are clothed, when you are raised from the dead, makes everything perfect wherever you are. You inherit a body. And wherever you go, everything is perfect. Nothing can remain imperfect in your presence. So heaven is not a realm. Heaven is a body. You actually inherit the kingdom of heaven. You inherit a body. And if I came into hell, instantly hell is transformed into heaven. If I walked through the desert, they would all blossom, instantly blossom. All the gates would turn into flowers, that so-called sand. If I walked through the petrified forest, these dead trees would burst into flowers, burst into fruit. Wherever you go, nothing remains imperfect. You could go into, as I did, among all the blind, the hogs, the wizards, the shrunken. And as I walked by, everyone became perfect. The blind, who had no eyes. Eyes came out of the nowhere and filled these empty sockets. Arms that were missing came back and filled the so-called missing area. And those who could not walk jumped. And those who could not speak spoke. And everything was made perfect as I simply walked by. And yet I did not raise one finger to do anything. It wasn't even compassion on my part. I simply walked by. Clothed in that garment. And that garment is perfect. And because it is perfect, nothing can remain imperfect in its presence. That's what you are going to inherit. But with what body do they come? The body that God has chosen for them. And I tell you that body is perfect. And I can only describe it as something that is altogether different. Yet no loss of identity. I will know you in eternity. Yet you are transformed. And the body is in flesh and blood. Is simply a living, pulsing, radiant body, a body of life, but it's perfect. And as you walk by, among anyone, the minute you walk by, they're transformed. They have to be perfect because you're perfect. And if you made your visit into hell, hell ceases to be hell, as far as you're concerned, it's heaven. Everything is transformed wherever you go. <coughs> and you do not raise a finger to make it so. It's all done. So I tell you what's in store for you. And I'm speaking from experience. I know. I am not speculating. I am not theorizing. He rose in me not as another. But he rose in me. He didn't stand there. He rose in me. But how do I know he rose in me? For the same thing that is recorded in scripture concerning him is now my experience. Same thing happened in me. Was it not said of him, when you go, that this event has taken place, you'll find a little infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. Well, they came, they didn't see me, as you're told in Scripture. 
The tomb was empty. The body was removed. But him they did not see. Why? Because you are spirit. But you are aware of all that is transpiring, all that is taking place. Did they will not call him my Lord, or they will call me my Lord. Did he not say the Son of Man must rise like a fiery serpent in the same manner that Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness? For the same thing happened in me. And not a serpent rose, I was the serpent, the fiery serpent that rose. Was he not said of him that the Holy Spirit would be seen in the form of doubt and remain upon him what it happened in me? And when he came among the people, did they recognize him? No. Did they believe the story? They said no. It sung like an idle tale, and they did not believe it. And then he said to them, O foolish men, and slow of heart to believe what the prophet written about the Son of Man. And then beginning with Moses and the prophets, he interpreted to them in all the scriptures the things concerning himself. They still did not recognize him. And then, as he walked, he wanted to go beyond. And they said, remain with us. And he remained with them. And then suddenly, their eyes were open. And they recognized him and he vanished out of their sight. And then they say to each other, did not our hearts burn within us when he opened our minds to understand the scriptures? And then he said to them, All that is written about me in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. So you are here for one purpose, to fulfill God's word, that you may become awake as to who you are. And when you come awake to who you are, you realize you are God himself. For it was his purpose in the beginning to give you himself. He couldn't give you himself if you could inherit him unless he died, for God died. Unless I die, thou canst not live. But if I die, I shall arise again and thou with me. So he dies. And then you become God. So God lives because you actually inherit God. So the whole vast world is simply God unfolding. There's nothing but God in the world. Nothing but God. He is buried in you now. And he is dreaming the life that you are experiencing. And the day is going to come, and I hope soon, when he will awake with you. And may I tell you when he awakes, oh, what an earth mercy. What a quake, your whole head. You've experienced the last quake, that is a little tiny shake compared to what's going to happen in you. Your head will shake as you've never known an earthquake. And every bone you see to you is coming apart. But instead of coming apart, you find yourself waiting. And you wait within the tomb of your own skull. And you're all alone. And you come out. And exactly what to do to get out. And you do it. You roll away the stone. It's all done by you. No one else, no one else rolls the stone away. You push and the stone rolls away. And you come out of that God. And then everything that is said in Scripture concerning Jesus Christ is taking place around you. And you are the invisible one observing the entire thing. Even the witnesses who come to witness what the angel said, go and you'll find a little infant wrapped in swaddling clothes. And there's the infant. And they call you by name. And they say whose infant it is. So you know who was born. Because you actually came out of that tomb. And then you tell it. Tell it to those who are here.
to listen. Because they are going to follow you in your footsteps and you will not be better then because you preceded them. Not for one moment are you better because you can't be better than God. So no one is better than because he precedes it in the order. Each call in its own order. And there's no desire on your part to be better than anyone of the world because we're all one. It's only God. And God is one. So God became as we are, that we may be as God is. And to become as we are, he has to die. Completely forget who he is in becoming man. So I tell you, the stories, all the stories of scripture are all about you. You were chosen in the beginning. He chose us in him before the foundation of the world, as we are told in Ephesians. That was our call. But he came down for a purpose. He didn't know that we actually inherited the world. We were like the first son who remained and didn't come out. And complained when something was given to another. And when the father said to him, son, go with me always. And all that is mine is yours. He still was not pacified because he didn't understand that it was all his. But you and I came out and we go through hell. We are slaves in this world. Slaves to the body that we wear. I must feed it, clothe it, shelter it. And even if I'm out of a job, I still have to shelter it, clothe it, and feed it. I must not only assimilate the food, I must expel what I can't assimilate, and I'm a slave of the body that I wear. And if you analyze what man has to do to keep this thing going, this cross that he wears, well, it is really repulsive. If you actually take it into consideration and think what you have to do morning, noon, and night with this body, it is a very repulsive thing. And here I am a slave of it. And I remain a slave until I awaken within it and come out. And then a body has been prepared for me. And that body is perfect. And clothed in that body, I am no longer naked. Here we think we are very well clothed with all the fashions of the world. We are called naked in the scripture until that body becomes our body. As we are told in the second chapter, or rather the second letter of Paul to the Corinthians, the fifth chapter, the very first three verses. If you aren't clothed in this, you are naked. This, you are naked. No matter what fashion you wear, you're naked in this. And one must have that heavenly garment, not made with hands, in order to be properly clothed. But one day you'll get it. Everyone is going to get it. No one can fail. Because God is doing it. And God will clothe himself as you in the garment that he chose for you. No, I am not saying that everyone is going to have the identical. No, I'm not saying that at all. I know I will know you. Because Wednesday morning when I call attention to five or six days to look up you knew me heard me, and you could only look down and see the reflection of what I'm looking at, reflected on a page. I was trying to tell you how different the cubic reality that I am observing from the plain depiction of it, that you were observing on something just the size of it, but you wouldn't look up, or maybe you couldn't look up, but if you could only see that garment. It took in the entire sky, a heavenly blue as a background, and what beautiful pattern 
made out of gossamer, transparent white clouds. But you saw the reflection on a flat surface. But the day will come, all this will be clothed in these garments. And these are called the garments of glory. So Paul said, I do not consider the sufferings of the present time worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the whole creation groans waiting for the revealing of the sons of God. 